Lord Jesus, as we're surrounded by the, the scenes of Christmas, Lord, we're reminded of your sacrificial gift to us to come to be Emmanuel, God with us and your perfect life and your sacrificial death on the cross and the power of your resurrection and we can sing that song with assurance the hope of heaven Jesus because you made a way you made a way for us and so Lord as we've sung that song and we've sung these songs of praise now Lord we, we tune our ears and we tune our hearts to your eternal word so, Lord, open our hearts and open our ears. Help us to take in this reality, this, this hope of heaven that lies in front of us. And, Lord, let us live that out every day. And may it start today. And we pray all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Shoreline Church. We are in our final week in this journey through the book of Revelation and it has been quite a journey, quite challenging and quite rewarding. And I'm always reminded of Pastor Kevin in week one, he, he gives us the, kind of the overarching theme of Revelation is God wins, hang in there. God wins, hang in there. And today we get to see the culmination of that victory. God wins. And so the question for us then is, have we been hanging in there? Have we been hanging in there in the reading and the, the weekly messages? And if you haven't, I'm just encourage you to maybe go back and watch some of the previous messages and, and read those scriptures again. But just a beautiful reminder to us of God's plan for us as we read through the book of Revelation. And today we're going to see a sneak preview of the end of time, the beginning of eternity, the end of time, the end of time, beginning of eternity. Now, we all love sneak previews, don't we? Don't we? We love sneak previews. In fact, we love sneak previews for products like this. You remember that picture there? Yeah, that's it. That's the iPhone, the original iPhone in 2007. I mean, we all got one of those back then. We said, boy, this is going to make my life a whole lot easier, isn't it? Little did we know what we had in store for us, huh? How about this one? We love sneak previews of vehicles like this. Yes, the Tesla Cybertruck. Now, they've been doing sneak previews for this thing for like three years. It hasn't even come out in production. It doesn't even come out in production yet until 2022. And then we also see movies. We love sneak previews of movies. These 2022 summer blockbusters. Yes, that's right. Tom Cruise and Keanu Reeves, the ageless wonders are back to make us happier again, right? <laughs> and we even love sneak previews of babies. We call them ultrasounds. And uh, this baby is actually very special to my wife and I. This is grandbaby number nine. This is our son and our daughter-in-law's first baby. This is Remy. And she truly is coming soon to a home near you. She's coming soon. This week, as a matter of fact, so my daughter-in-law is due. So we're excited to welcome little Remy into our arms. Um, and it is as amazing and just as exciting as these sneak previews are, nothing compares to the most incredible sneak preview of all time. And that is the sneak preview of the end of time and the beginning of eternity. We're walking through the book of Revelation, and we see that in Revelation 21 and 22. And we see this, the glory and the majesty and the splendor of our eternal home. And we see the intimacy and the joy and the peace and the serenity and the comfort of being with God himself eternally. Amen? And so what we're going to do is we're going to unpack this. First, we're going to get a vision. We're going to get a better picture of what we see here. And we're going to read from Revelation 21. We'll just take a, a snapshot. Again, this is a sneak preview. We're going to get some snapshots this morning of that. And so if you have your Bibles, if you want to open your Bibles to Revelation 21, we're going to read verses 1 through 4 and then 9 through 11. And for some of you, you've got your Bible app. But for some of you, I want to give you permission today, as Pastor Kevin's done, Revelation was a vision, so if it helps you to close your eyes and listen, I want to encourage you. Yes, a pastor is giving you permission to close your eyes during his sermon. Amen? I'll leave it to you when you want to open them. So let's read from Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. 
They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Let's jump forward to verse 9. It says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And so when we read through the book of Revelation, as Pastor Kevin and Pastor Dennis have reminded us that Revelation is filled with symbols, and there's figurative language, and there's this literal language. And so today, what we don't want to do is get caught up in trying to figure out what all the symbols and all the different languages, is it figurative or is it literal? We want to make sure that we just trust that God will reveal that to us as we go through our life. But also, here's the other part. This is a sneak preview My father-in-law used to say that whenever we have a question in the Bible, especially in Revelation, we won't fully know on this side of glory, amen? But someday we can ask Jesus face to face. And so when we look at Revelation 21, what do we see then? What do we see then? And we see this beautiful picture of the culmination and splendor of God's redemptive work. God's redemptive work. And we think about Scripture from Genesis all the way through Revelation. It's the story of God's redemption, God's rescue plan for humanity. Humans, he created, and he's restoring that relationship with mankind. And here we see the culmination of that, the victory of Jesus Christ and the gathering of the church eternally. And so what we see here is, first, we see creation renewed. We see this new heaven and new earth. And the new earth, of course, is this eternal dwelling place for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And this new earth, it will be as God originally intended it. It will be Eden restored. You remember back in Genesis 2, the Garden of Eden, a perfect place where God himself walked with Adam and Eve, and they enjoyed this fellowship, this beautiful garden. And when we read Revelation 21 and 22, we see pictures of the garden, the new earth as God had originally intended it. So what about our earth and everything in it today? What about our earth today? 2 Peter 3.10 says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And so we think about the new heavens and the new earth. This is not just a remodel. This is not just God's extreme makeover. This is all new construction and all new creation, amen? And so we think about this new earth, that this new earth, this new earth actually is a place where we will have community restored. We will have community restored. There will be proximity and there will be an intimacy with God, that closeness in the original garden where Adam and Eve walked with God. In verse 3, when we read that passage, it says, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. That's God himself, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And he will dwell with them, which implies that he is with us, and we will be with him eternally. A beautiful picture of the closeness, the fellowship restored. Verse 4, we read that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's just a picture, this idea of wiping tear, wiping tears. It's a picture of intimacy and comfort and tenderness. I mean, think for a moment in your lifetime, as a young boy or young girl, maybe you tripped and you fell and you skinned your knee. And who was there to wipe away that tear, those tears of pain? Maybe it was your mom or your dad or maybe it was grandpa or grandma. Maybe it was your brother or your sister, and they got down on their knees, and they went like this, and they wiped away those tears of pain. And here what we see in this new heaven and new earth is God himself, and he's going to wipe away every tear. He will wipe away those tears, those tears of pain, those tears of suffering, those tears of anguish, those tears that come from death itself. 
And we know that as parents, if you've ever raised a child, you know that there's plenty of tears. And you've had those precious moments where you've wiped away tears. And you know that in those moments, that all you can do is offer comfort in the midst of the tears. But you can never change the cause of those tears. God himself, not only does he comfort us in our tears, but God is going to remove the cause of those tears. And we see that the curse is removed. Sin and its effects are no more. Sin, the root cause of pain and suffering and death. And we know that this new earth will be completely free from sin, from evil, from sickness, from suffering and death. And we think about the cause of sin. It's all rooted back in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God and they ate the forbidden fruit. And that was the original sin. And sin, of course, we inherit that sin. And for us, that sin is any wrong thought, any wrong word, any wrong action. It's in, literally a rebellion against God himself. R.C. Sproul, great preacher who's now with Jesus, once said, it's cosmic treason. Sin is cosmic treason. And we know that that sin, that Jesus Christ came and he lived a perfect life and he died a sacrificial death on the cross to pay the price for that sin. And when we give our life to Jesus Christ and we respond and receive his grace, Jesus then fills us with the Holy Spirit. And we are now removed from the power of sin. Sin has no more power over us. But we know throughout our life that sin is ever-present, is it not? Our own sin, our own sinfulness is always there. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit to convict us, not if we sin, but when we sin, and to redirect and correct us. And we know that we live in a sinful, broken world. We don't have to look far to see the effects of sin. But in our eternal home, God completely removes the presence of sin. And we see that in Revelation 6 through 20, that God has removed that, that sin has been cast out of God's presence and his children's presence eternally, amen? We also see this, Christ rewarded. We see Jesus Christ rewarded, the bride of Christ. Jesus' crown and jewel is the church. And what is the church? It's the bride of the Lamb. It's the bride of Christ. And it's the church, not just Shoreline Church, but it's Christian churches all over this world, all throughout history. It's people like you and me who placed our faith in Jesus Christ, the church, the bride of the Lamb. And what image did God use in Revelation to help us capture the beauty and the purity and the radiance of the church? It says this, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I mean, that is a picture, a, a bride dressed for her wedding day, a beautiful picture of purity and beauty that transcends all cultures and history. And God chose that picture. When you think about that picture of a bride on her wedding day, I have the unique honor and privilege as a pastor here at Shoreline Church of, of being able to officiate covenant of marriage ceremonies. And there's always that moment in every wedding ceremony when everybody is seated, the guests are seated, and everybody's there, family, friends, and all of a sudden, the doors open, and there she comes, and everyone stands, and they turn, and they look at the bride, dressed for her wedding day, beautiful, stunning, radiant. And we look, and we see that. But as a pastor at Shoreline, I also get to see another look, and I get to look to the groom who's standing there in front of me, and I see his face filled with joy as he's about ready to receive his bride. And here's a picture. Imagine Jesus Christ at this moment, in, in time, whenever that is, we don't know when that's going to be, Jesus prepared to receive his bride, Jesus Christ, his church, from all those from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, from every neighborhood, people like you and I gathered together, and Jesus Christ is there to receive them in this beautiful dwelling place, this new Jerusalem 
our eternal home. And so what I want to do is I want to ask this question. Can you see what once was marred and scarred, and now you see it renewed and restored for eternity? What once was marred and scarred, I mean, we don't have to look very far. We can just think about our world today. It's filled with sickness and sadness and loneliness and death. I could go on and on. Think about it. This new home, we've replaced it. It's been replaced, completely new. Wholeness, healing, community, peace, serenity. It's our home, our magnificent home that we get to look forward to someday. And so what I want to do now is shift gears and say, okay, so how do we apply this? How do we better understand this truth and apply it to our lives? How do we take hold of this? And so to help us do that, I want to use a technique that's called comparative perspective. And it's simply this, judging something against a previous event or different person, place, or thing. Now, at first it sounds technical, but it's really actually pretty simple. Let me just give you three illustrations from food. So first, here's one. As good as Costco pumpkin pie is... It's not as good as grandma's homemade pumpkin pie, amen? And for those of you who are married, my wife's pumpkin pie, there we go. Um, As good as store-bought produce is, it's nowhere near as good as that fresh produce that you pull from your own garden, amen? Here's one for us, the last one. As good as fish tacos are at one of our many restaurants here in Monterey County, Nothing compares to Pastor Dennis's fish tacos. <laughs> well, and so when we, we share that, here's what's important to take, is it doesn't minimize, when I, when I share that comparative perspective, it doesn't minimize the first portion of the clause of the sentence, but it maximizes the second part, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And so we think about this idea of our new home. Here's number one. As beautiful and majestic as this earth and heavens are, God's new creation will be infinitely more stunning and glorious. I mean, infinitely more stunning and glorious. And it's hard to believe because we live in one of the most beautiful, spectacular, stunning, and glorious places here in Monterey County. Amen? And when you go stand out on the, you go down Big Sur and just watch the sunset over the Pacific Ocean, it's hard to imagine anything more majestic and magnificent. But our eternal home We can't even compare this earth to that. Let's read in Revelation 21, verses 15 through 16. It says, The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. And so if we look at this literally, and again, we, don't, we can't know for sure on this side of glory. Is it literal? Is it figurative? Or is it symbolic? In this case, if we look literally, though, just think about 12,000 stadia equals 1,400 miles or 2,200 kilometers. And so what I'm going to do is we've got an image here to show you a 2D image of what that type of space would look like. 1,400 miles. It covers over half of the United States. So it puts it in perspective, doesn't it? just how magnificent and big this city will be. Now, if these numbers are figurative and they're not literal, it's still meant to convey a couple of things. Number one, stunning and massive, which means there's plenty of room for you and I and a whole lot more other people, amen? And I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John John 14 too, when Jesus said to the disciples, he said, in my Father's house has many rooms. I am going ahead to prepare a place for you. This is Jesus' house he's referring to here, amen? There's plenty of room for us. We also know that our home is not only massive and magnificent, it's a home that's beyond description and beyond our dreams. We read in Revelation 21, verses 19 through 21, the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. That is a whole lot of gorgeous gems and jewels, amen? Amen. Verse 21 says the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. 
Then the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. And again, we know that Revelation is filled with symbols and figurative language, so we don't know, is this literal? But what's the picture here? That our new home is going to be more. It's splendor and magnificent and beauty and unimagined. I mean, just think about it. This picture that the city walls, our foundations are layered with jewels and gems. The 12 gates are covered with pearl, a single pearl on each gate. And heaven's asphalt is made up of what, church? Gold. Gold. Beautiful picture. And the point is this, is our eternal home will be more stunning and glorious than we can ever imagine. A beautiful picture for us. The second statement is this, as abundant and blessed as we are in this lifetime, an eternity of unending and unimaginable blessings awaits. Unending and unimaginable blessings. Now, I don't know about you, but I am so blessed. I am blessed beyond imagination, even my wildest dreams. I've been so blessed by God. And I know for each one of you, you could probably say the same. But yet what we see here is that we will have more unimaginable and absolutely blessings that will be eternal that we can't even fathom. But we get a small snapshot of what that might look like in Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And that healing of the nations, it really implies it's giving health to the nations. So this giving health, so this this blessings that we'll inherit, you have to see this, this river of the water of life. And so when earlier when we read that passage and it talked about there'll be no more sea, And the sea, of course, in near ancient thought, was that the sea was a symbol and a sign of evil and chaos. But yet the river, all throughout Old Testament, all throughout Scripture, see that the river is a symbol of peace and serenity and goodness and provision and abundance. And so we see that the source of the river is what? It's the source. The river is flowing from God's throne. And we're reminded of Jesus himself He says, I am, he's the living water. The water he gives us, we will never thirst again. He gives us water and we will have eternal life. And now here's that source. It's the throne of God and the lamb. Eternal satisfaction and provision. And we also see the picture of the tree of life. Remember back in Genesis 2, there was the tree of life. And we see that, that this sort, that today, the picture here is abundance and provision and harmony, and healing, life-giving, and health-bringing. The blessing that we have to look forward to. And so we see in this picture these eternal blessings of peace and serenity and provision and satisfaction and abundance and health. What a picture for us, especially when we consider what we live in today, amen? And what we're walking through today in our time of history. Our third statement is this, as deep as our intimacy and relationship is with Jesus, nothing can compare to being with him for eternity. And as glorious and magnificent as heaven is, I am so looking forward to meeting Jesus face to face, amen? That's the best part, our eternal home, to be face to face in the presence of God himself. Revelation 22 verses 3 through 5 says this, no longer will there be any curse And that, of course, is the curse is sin and the effects of sin. So the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, and they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. These are God's eternal promises for us. And when we read those portions of Scripture, we see that this in, when we're unhindered and unleashed from the presence of sin, we're now in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that statement says, his name will be on their foreheads. And of course, name reveals character. And his name will be on our foreheads. 
Jesus Christ, the character of Christ will be on us. We will be the character of Christ. We will have the character of Christ. We also see in this picture, this picture of eternal security and safety because there's no more night. There's no fear. There's no evil. And we don't need the sun, S-U-N, because we have the what? We have the who, the S-O-N with a capital S, eternally, amen? And finally, our fourth statement, as painful and as hard as this life can be, the eternal joy, peace, and health that awaits us far exceeds our temporary suffering. The eternal joy, peace, and health that awaits us far exceeds our temporary suffering Revelation 21.4, I'm going to read that verse again. I want you just to let this rest in your heart, and rest in your mind. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. No more death, mourning, crying, or pain because in the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection, he has done what? He has put death to death. He's put joyful songs out of our songs of sorrow and he's given us victory and we can celebrate as we look forward, as we live our lives today. And we also know that many of us have lost loved ones and friends and in this past season in particular, it's been very difficult. But we know that those loved ones who loved Jesus and loved us, that one day we will be reunited with them, amen? And we also know that it says there's no more pain And we know that Jesus Christ, he promises us as his followers that one day, just as he was resurrected, that same resurrection power, that we will be resurrected. And that we will have new resurrection bodies. Now, I don't know what that looks like, and I don't know what, but I'm looking forward to that, amen? Because I realize that this frail and fragile, breaking and broken body that I have now, someday will be new in Christ, And I was reminded of that just a couple of years ago when I realized that I was losing my hearing. And so just give a picture of kind of like what was happening. Uh, I'd be down front for prayer and somebody might come up and they'd say something like, Pastor Sean, will you pray for me? Pray for my brother. He's serving in Afghanistan. But what I heard was, Pastor Sean, pray for my uncle. He's surfing in Pakistan. Now imagine my surprise, like that doesn't sound, oh, okay, I'll pray for him, but that doesn't sound like a great place to surf. And so off I went to the VA, and the VA doctor said, son, it's time for you to get hearing aids. So for the last couple of years, I've been navigating this thing called hearing aids. And the other uh, couple of days ago, I was getting ready to leave the house. My wife, Amy, she says, hey, did you forget to put in your hearing aids? And I said, What? And she said, I guess that answers that. So not not only have I losing my hearing, apparently now I'm losing my memory. So one day, one day I'm looking forward to my renewed and restored body in Jesus Christ. So as we ask ourselves a question then out of those four statements, how might these eternal truths shift my perspective and priorities in the present and future? I mean, maybe today you'd say my, earth, my focus really has been kind of on the earth, what's going on around me in current situation. How do we shift that earthly focus to an eternal focus? And how do we shift from maybe an eternal perspective? Now, maybe today we're struggling, we're thinking about it. I'm just focused on things of the day, and I need to shift that perspective. And so I want to encourage you just to ask God. Ask God how he might change your focus and change your perspective as you reflect on these words and in the power of, of the Revelation, Revelation 21, 22. And so as glorious and as magnificent as heaven will be and our new eternal home, the new Jerusalem, it'd be easy for us to say, Jesus, take me home today, amen? But here's the truth, church. Until he does, until he chooses to take us home, or until he returns We've got unfinished work to do, don't we? And so, church, we're going to move into this last section. We're going to get a move on it. We're going to take some action in our lives. These kind of four big challenges for us today, church, is this. Number one, we will live with a heavenly mindset no matter where on earth we are. No matter where on earth we are. See, Jesus' disciples and the apostles in the early church, 
They understood and embraced the power of the resurrection, the power and the promises of eternal life in Christ, and they lived it out. And we are here today as the faithful work of God through them. So what I want to do is share some verses from Scripture from the apostles and the disciples as they look forward to this eternal home. In 2 Peter 3, verses 13 to 14, we read this. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. See, Peter's point here is that we should be looking forward, not looking backward. We shouldn't be looking back and dwelling on the sins of our past and our focus is back there. We shouldn't be falling back into sinful patterns, habits, and behaviors. We should be not falling for the schemes of the enemy who lies and tries to deceive us and tries to discourage us from being reminded of the hope of heaven. And so how do we do that? In the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we humbly submit to his leading his correcting and redirecting and also to remind us to focus on our eternal home. And our second challenge is this. We will invest in our eternal family. We will engage in consistent community. The Apostle Paul writes these words in Romans 12, verse 13. He says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, why in the world did Paul say we have to practice hospitality? Because it's not easy. It's not easy for us. And so Paul is telling us that we need to practice hospitality, which means share your life, share your homes, share your resources, share your experiences, share your highs, share your lows, share your joys, share your sorrows, share and pray and live life together. Because your eternal family is going to be your eternal, my eternal family, your eternal family will be family forever. So let's get to know each other on this side of glory, amen? And I'm reminded just of the power of this is every Tuesday night I have the opportunity to be part of a young men's Bible study. Now you can guess I'm not the young man, but these are men ages 20 to, to, ages 20 to 30, and I have the opportunity to be part of that Bible study. And I have just been overjoyed over the last almost two years of watching these young men pour into each other, pray for one another, check in with one another, share God's word with one another, experience life together. These are young men from 20 to 39, and they're living and experiencing life together, and we're doing that online. We're meeting regularly online. The power of our eternal family and getting to know one another and sharing life together. Our third we will, big challenge, prepare and share. Heaven is not just for me. Heaven's not just for me, and it's not just for you. So we have to be prepared to share. Peter writes this in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And revere Christ as Lord, that means to treasure him, treasure Jesus above everything else. And out of that reality, he says this, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. You see, Peter's point here is that we need to always be ready to share Jesus Christ. Always be ready when the opportunity affords itself to share Jesus. We've got to share the story of the gospel. And so I was thinking about this Thursday as Thanksgiving. And for some of you, like my family, we typically gather around a table somewhere and there'll be an opportunity where some will say, okay, share something you're thankful for. And one by one, people will go around and they'll share. What if this year, if that was your family, if you took the opportunity to say, I'm thankful for Jesus and the hope of heaven that he offers me. Imagine the conversation that that might start. And so my encouragement would be, would you pray about that? Pray about a way that you could share Jesus' story with others and the hope that he offers you. And if it's this Thanksgiving as the Spirit leads, I would say follow the leading and engage in a conversation. And our final we will, we will focus on what matters most. 
keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and the hope of heaven. Now church, I'm not going to deny that life is hard. It is hard. And I'm reminded of that every day. The sadness and the loneliness and the suffering. And for many of us this past couple years, we've seen too many loved ones and friends have gone home to be Jesus, gone home to meet Jesus face to face. But church, here's the point, that we have the hope of heaven, and we should not lose heart, and we have to continue to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and the promises that he offers us. And how do we do that? We do that through prayer. We do that through staying in God's word, to be reminded of the hope that's in store for us. And we do that in community with one another. We're not in this alone. And so a question for us, final question today, is what is one step for me to take today that will better prepare me for eternity? What's one step that you need to take today? Now, if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, for you, maybe it's that you need to get back in a more vibrant, active prayer life. Maybe it's getting back in the word of God. Maybe you need to be more consistent in studying and reading and enjoying and embracing and being filled with God's word. Or maybe it's engaging in community. Maybe it's reconnecting with some of the folks that you've not been able to connect with in this past 18, 20 months or so. Ask God to show you. I'm sure he will. And for those of you today that maybe joined us or you were invited here or you're joining us online, that you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. And today, maybe as you've heard God's word, maybe that's sparked questions for you. I want to encourage you, maybe for you today, one step to better prepare you for eternity is to have a conversation, a conversation with someone maybe that invited you today, or maybe it's one of, one of our pastors, myself and Pastor Brandon and other pastors. We would love to have a conversation with you about that. And so as we think back in the entire series of Revelation, we're going to wrap up today with a song of reflection and celebration. So I'm going to invite the band back up here, and before I, I pray, they're going to prepare us, and they're going to, Cole's going to share a song that's a celebration, a song that celebrates the power of Jesus' resurrection and what that means for us. The idea that one day we will have this beautiful homecoming, homecoming with those loved ones who love Jesus, those friends, those family members, and we will be face-to-face with Jesus Christ forever. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, We thank you for the hope of heaven that you offer. And Jesus, now as we sing this song, this song that declares the truth, the power of your resurrection, and what you saved us from, our sinfulness, our brokenness, our separation from you. And Lord, the reality, out of that resurrection, out of the power of the resurrection, and the eternal truths of your word, we look forward to the homecoming where we'll see you face to face. We thank you, Jesus, for this. In your name we pray, amen.